And Martin is going to tell us uh, the things he has learned about building large-scale, fast API APIs. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, been a while that I've been in a university. I'm 39 years old, so that's been a while. Um, my name is Maarten. Um, I come from Belgium, and I work for a Belgium-based uh, fintech. Uh, as a Python developer, I work on several internal uh, microservices. Um, in a short nutshell, I'm not here to promote the company, but let me quickly explain and give a little bit of context so that you understand a little bit more what I'm going to talk about. So it's a fintech company based in Belgium. Our flagship product is that we automatically invest savings of people in stocks and things like that. It's not a quick, rich scheme. It's decent investment. They're like, it's um, developed jointly with the University of Leuven. Um, if you want to get rich quickly, buy crypto or try. Um, <laughs> So what I'm going to talk about is about Fast API. Um, in case you haven't heard about Fast API, it's a relatively new Python framework, but it gained a lot of uh, momentum in the recent years uh, as one of the new Python frameworks. Um, we started with it like two years ago. I didn't knew it two years ago, so for me it was new. I'm the type of developer that doesn't read documentation, so I just jump into it, so you also run into trouble. Um, it's mainly built on top of Starlet um, and also Pydantic. Pydantic is like Python data classes, um, but in my opinion, a bit better. It adds a lot of more extra features to validate data. As you can see, um, I read last week that it overtook the number of GitHub stars um, of uh, the Spring framework in Java, for example, so that, that says something about the framework. It's created by Sebastian Ramirez. I've never met the person, uh, I've never met him in person, uh, but on social media it's very approachable. I often email or ask him things if I'm stuck and he pretty helps me fast. Um, and the documentation is excellent. Um, if you don't know the framework, if you, if, or if you even don't know Python, go to the um, getting started and you will be up and running in five minutes or maybe 10 minutes if you're using Conda. So what I assume is that you know a little bit of the basics of Fast API, um, web development in general, Pydantic and Python, of course. So in the next, 25 minutes by now, I'm going to run you through five learnings we had, mistakes we made, what we learned uh, out of that. Um, it's not necessarily about fast API, it's also about like programming problems, that's what we do, we make mistakes. So the first thing um, that, um, that I wanted to talk about is um, in your web application or in your fast, applica fast API application, you have to try to minimize the global state. Um, and fast API has a mechanism for that to avoid that. So short recap, what is global state app as it is defined at the top of the file? Um, it's the global state. So you define your fast, fast API application in the global state. Um, that's it. Um, what you then do is you want to connect to a database, in this case MongoDB, you create your connection there your, or your client, um, and then in your endpoint, as you see at the bottom, you connect to your database. That's fine, that will work, that's um, easy. Um, but in general, not only in Python, um, global state um, is a bad practice. Um, uh, you easily end up there because Fast API itself is defined in the global state. Um, why is the bad practice? It's pretty hard to patch um, in unit tests, for example. Or if you want to um, have access to the global state, you have to import it from another file. You easily end up in circular dependencies or inline import statements. And the moment you start doing that, you should know that you're doing things wrong, like I did. Um, so I had to read a little bit of documentation and change some code. Um, so what is the most easy solution um, for avoiding a little bit of global state is make that connection in your endpoint. This is also okay, but the downside of this is that when you're connecting to a database, um, these clients usually have um, connection pools. So if you do this, what you see here, um, you don't really use the connection pools because you're always setting up the database connection when there is an incoming request. So this is not super efficient either. Um, so the thing is, um, 
fast API has a mechanism called dependency injection. If you know a little bit of Spring in Java, you are familiar with the dependency injection mechanism. Um, in Python, it's not really common, but fast API adopted the lightweight version of dependency injection. What it does, it injects a function in another function um, coming from somewhere. In this case, fast API itself. Um, if you see at the bottom, the last function, you see that there is called depends, and then you add the function as a parameter. What will result in, when there is an incoming request, fast API will inject that function in there, and you can have access to that connection pool of MongoDB. How is that different from the previous example? Um, it is that fast API will cache the get connection function. So it gets reused across your ap application and other endpoints. Um, small remark here, um, if you're familiar with MyPy, MyPy will complain about that line because MyPy doesn't like you to add as a default function that gets, uh, code that gets executed. So you have to exclude that rule in MyPy, otherwise you will cry. Um, so this is what we started to do to structure your application. This is also advised on the documentation of Fast API. We added all our dependencies, like connections to MongoDB, Redis, Kafka, um, in a dependencies file, nothing more than that, and also the configuration of that. We have split up our entire code base in different routers per concern, and we stitch everything so the routers, they import from, depend, from the dependencies. The dependencies file itself doesn't have a dependency on any other parts of the fast API application. So it keeps your application or your logic decoupled from each other, and everything gets stitched together in the app.py file. That's um, about dependency injection. If you go to the documentation of fast API, um, I, I, in my opinion, it's a bit undervalued, that part, but it's a very powerful part, because if you avoid global state, you will be happy. So how can you, um, we also struggled with um, test, our test suite, um, and basically the learning of making your test suite maintainable or, or um, easy to set up is just avoid global state. Um, you will be happy. Um, what you usually do when you want to test an API, you start overwriting configs, environment variables. If you're using, probably you're using Docker, everything gets um, configured with environment variables. Um, you start mocking or patching data. Um, sometimes you have functions with a lot of mocks and patches, which is bad because then what are you actually testing? Um, and then you're also setting up a test client to actually do um, HTTP calls to your application. We're using PyTest. There are probably a number of other good frameworks. Um, I'm not very opinionated about that. Um, so what did we do and what is powerful about, fat, in this case, not really fast API, but fast API builds uh, on top of PyDantic. Um, there is a thing called base settings, which um, is a clause that you can define, and it automatically, when you instantiate it, it auto automatically maps all the environment variables to this clause. So if you see PyCon config, when you instantiate it, it will automatically map an environment variable log level to this property. The same goes for, MongoDB, for the MongoDB connection, things like that. Um, what is nice about it, since all your configurations are mapped on this object, um, you can easily um, instantiate that object and use that in your testing. You don't need to go dive into the internals of your functions and patch environment variables, which is not always easy because if you have to patch environment variables or global state, you have to do it before your code base is loaded, otherwise it will fail um, since environment variables won't be available. Um, and Fast API provides a basic mechanism um, specifically intended for that is you can override dependencies. So if you inject your config of your application everywhere in your endpoints, you can easily override that config. So you have a class, you instantiate it, you assign it to Fast API, and that overridden config will become available in every endpoint during your test run. The same goes for any other dependency. So um, this will also force you to, or this will easily force you to just stick with pure Python functions. 
or pure Python classes. This is nothing new, but a pure Python function, when it doesn't have any side effect, you don't need to patch anything. You can just pass in the parameters, test it, test the output, and, and you can validate that your function is working properly. Um, and I think this is clean code. So what we started to do is fast API is only the, the top layer of our application and all the downstream stream business logic has, doesn't have anything to do with fast API. It's just pure Python. Um, that's it. Now, my, the third part um, that I want to talk about is the pitfalls of asynchronous Python. It's uh, my favorite part. It's also the part I struggled the most with um, and that I learned the hard way. It's not necessarily an issue of fast API. It's more of the way Python is and works, but fast API is written in Python, and it also advocates asynchronous Python, um, but it's not as easy. So asynchronous Python is not as easy as it looks like. I don't know if anybody, yeah, probably, um, but if you already worked with asynchronous Python, I don't know if you really have struggled with it. Um, another thing with, well, it's not necessarily related to asynchronous Python, but it gets in the way anyway, it's the global interpreter lock. I used, before a few years, I never worked with machine learning or data science, and then you're not really blocked or you don't really stumble upon the gill. I knew it existed, but I didn't know what it actually was. Um, I was working with Django applications that go to a database, fetch data, uh, store data. You usually don't run into troubles with that, um, but, if you have CPU intensive code, which machine learning and pandas are behind the scenes, it blocks um, your CPU. What it basically does is, if there is a piece of code that is CPU intensive, the Python interpreter will block and all the other threads are blocked. Whether it's asynchronous or multi-threaded, it hangs until that one request, until that one piece of code finished. Um, it gets in the way anyway if you're doing asynchronous. Uh, Python, because the way asynchronous Python works, it's an event loop. It's a single thread in a single process. So combined with what I just told about the global interpreter lock, if it blocks, it, you can fire 1,000 asynchronous requests. They will all block. And I'll try to dem demonstrate. So the last thing I want to explain there as well is, besides the global interpreter lock, a lot of Python libraries are still synchronous. So they don't implement the async await construct, um, which is also troublesome if, you're, if you want to build asynchronous applications. Um, so here's a small piece of code which will make your application hang. Um, if you invoke the last function, time2, there is a sleep statement, which is a synchronous statement. Um, that endpoint will block for 10 seconds. If you at the same time invoke hello, it will also block for 10 seconds because the thread will be blocked because time.sleep is a synchronous statement. So as you can see, this, this will, I mean, you can write, and, and nobody will complain about it. There's no linters that's going to complain about it, as far as I know. MyPy doesn't complain, Flake, Black, nothing complains about it. Um, so if you put this in production, it's not always easy to, to track this down. The second, or the time one function, if you invoke that first, that will also sleep for 10 seconds. If you at the same time invoke hello again, that will respond immediately. Um, the reason why this uh, works that way is that the way FastAPI deals with it is if a function is defined as an asynchronous function, it will pass on the execution to the event loop. If it's not um, defined with asynchronous, it will pass it on to a thread pool. Um, and that is the way Django and Fast API, uh, Flask have been working for years. That model, um, that execution model works. What can you do with the sleep statement is there is an alternative on the right side. You can use asyncio.sleep. And then if you invoke time two first and then at the same time, hello, they both will, no, time two will wait for 10 seconds and hello will respond immediately. Um, but not all libraries have a counterpart for, let's say, time, which is a very simple example. Um, but not all libraries have a counterpart. Um, if you're connecting to a database, um, 
it means that you have to entirely rewrite your database layer to an asynchronous library in order to get this working. There are ways in FastAPI to make asynchronous code work with synchronous code, but I don't really like doing that because then you could easily argue to just write synchronous code. Okay, um, as I explained a little bit before, um, the global interpreter lock, imagine some um, machine learning code here or pandas, NumPy, it will block the CPU. So as long as count doesn't finish, hello won't respond, although it's asynchronous. Um, that's just because how the Gil in Python works. It has been debated heavily for years, um, but Hido always says no. <laughs> uh, so this is how I feel about the synchronous Python. Um, it's look sh it looks shiny to, to start to work with, but it, it's, it's, I think Node.js is doing a better job, although I like Python more than JavaScript. Um, so lessons learned here, a lot of Python libraries are not, uh, are not compatible with asynchronous and you just easily end up because you, you never know how your downstream code base looks like because you call a function, another function, and another function, which line of code is actually blocking, you don't know. So what we actually did is we removed all async prefixes of our code base, which makes our application basically multi-threaded. Um, and then what you do is, apart from fast API as well, we started to move all CPU bound um, execution to other parts of the code base or to other systems. So you can use a process pool executor, which means that it spawns a separate process, it offloads, it doesn't block the main fast API process, it's run somewhere else in another process. The downside is that it, it has some ramp up time to spawn that process, which is in, in an API world not always desirable. Um, we deploy a lot of our microservices on Lambda. Uh, Lambda is by default actually multi-process uh, multi uh, because it, it, it scales out um, automatically. You don't have to do anything for that. And like a lot of heavy computations are offloaded to other systems by putting things on a queue. So second lesson learned for me here as well, read this part of the fast API. Um, if you don't understand it from the first run, read it again, because I think it's really important that you understand the way Python deals with asynchronous, um, execute, with asynchronous execution model. Um, a fourth thing I wanted to talk about is how we can support uh, multiple authentication schemes. Um, we had a use case where we wanted to support um, JWT, JWT tokens and API keys. Basically, a customer asked for that. They paid a lot, so we had to do it. Um, and then we run actually into troubles with FastAPI a little bit. Um, FastAPI has a lot of utilities to deal with that. Um, and all of these utilities, they integrate very nicely with the documentation. So if you haven't worked with FastAPI, one of the strong things of FastAPI is that it automatically generates an open API spec. So you don't have to maintain a Swagger file or an open API uh, file to uh, define your um, API. It automatically generates it based on your code base. So that's also nice then with the utilities for authentication because the Swagger becomes interactive, you add your API keys and you can start testing your API. To define this, there's obviously there's a lot of documentations and there are a lot of examples to implement API keys or basic auth and um, OAuth 2 um, but it doesn't really come with batteries included. So a lot of the implementations of these things you have to do yourself, especially OAuth, you have to implement it yourself. Um, and FastAPI is built on top of Starlet. Starlet is an asynchronous um, framework Fast API is a, a, a layer that makes it more convenient to work with. Um, so Starlet also have, has half authentication um, mechanisms, but Fast API is different. The way Fast API approaches, approaches it is different than from Starlet. 
If you're coming from Django, you will be familiar with middleware, middlewares. So Starlet you, um, sol solves it with a middleware. So you define a middleware, you define your Starlet application, and you say, okay, these are the middlewares which makes basically all of the endpoints authenticated. And then you define your endpoint where you um, fetch a user um, and it becomes authenticated. Um, the way your middleware works, works is a request comes in, the middleware does something, passes on the request to a function, it returns, and then it goes back to the middleware. The way Fast API solves it, it's like Fast API solves a lot of things um, with dependency injection. This is the part that I struggled a bit with um, because in the last function you see, okay, we want a user, so we inject that user, and then on, uh, above that function you see we inject the odd scheme, and then the odd scheme tries to fetch uh, the fake decode token tries to fetch a user from the database. Um, the big downside I see here or that I experience here is that you have to do that on every endpoint that you write. So it's a lot of duplication of code. Um, that's the first thing I, I dislike a bit. And the second thing I struggled with is if you want to support two authentication schemes, you have to basically write it like this. You try to fetch a JWT token or an API key. But the problem is that if there is no JWT token present, the first statement will already fail. So it basically becomes an end operation. So they both have to be present. You can solve this in an easy way by making both of them um, not like make them both fail silently, um, like setting auto error to false. But then you're actually switching off your authentication. Um, whether it's authenticated or not, it just passes on. So you have to write it a little bit yourself. You have to write a function like get user. If there are credentials, then we do something. If there is, uh, if there is, if there is an API key, we do something else. Otherwise, um, we raise an exception. So I personally like um, a middleware approach more. Um, because it decouples the authentication from your um, endpoints. Um, the user becomes available on the request. You just assume that it's there. Um, if, it's, if, if, an, if a request arrives in your endpoint, you can assume that the user is there or that it's at least authenticated. Um, and it gives also flexibility to put um, the authentication at router level. Um, because in, uh, in fast API, if you put the authentication, at the router level, the user is not available in the endpoint itself. Um, I still have two minutes left. Um, the last part I wanted to discuss is uh, a big mistake that we really made. Um, since we were a startup, or now growing towards scale-up, uh, we wanted to be fast and we didn't want to um, duplicate code. So what we did is we defined our database models. Um, they were exactly the same as our API models. We didn't want to define a database model and um, API models and map API requests onto a database model. The way we did it back in the days we thought, mm, it's pretty clever, um, is we uh, implemented it as an inheritance. Um, I'm going to skip this to um, buy some time. Um, so we implemented it as inheritance. And let me go first to this slide. So the first thing we did is we defined a patch um, model, then we inherited from that the patch model and we called it the portfolio response and then we inherited from that and we called it portfolio. The portfolio is actually the model that goes to the database but as you already can see, it's not very readable because can you say which fields are on the portfolio? In this example, it's pretty easy but it's obviously a much larger object. Um, and then the response is something um, you don't want the, I, the database ID to be patchable uh, in an API request. The way we did it this way is that um, Fast API generates documentation based on Pythantic models. So if, if I go back to this example, um, on the left, on the right side, you see that the documentation automatically generates an example, which is beautiful um, because you don't have to care about it because it's defined in code. Um, but what were the issues we had with this is that um, yeah, the models become hard to, to read. Um, and um, if you want to change the API contract, we couldn't um, unless we did a database migration. 
and the other way around. If we want to change a model, a field in the database, which then automatically reflects into a breaking change in the API contract, and our APIs are exposed to our customers or to our clients, and you cannot easily make, um, you cannot easily break your contract. Um, so the next steps that we are going, that we are currently doing is, okay, we are going to decouple that. That's a very big lesson learned here. Um, and there is a new thing in Python in one of the recent versions. Um, it's included in the typing library. It's called annotated. Um, what it allows you to do is to annotate a certain type. Um, as you can see in the portfolio fields, I define, I annotate a string type and I add metadata to it. Um, there I can add meta, there, I, there we can add pydentic metadata and we can reuse those um, fields um, into our portfolio patch and into our portfolio response to allow fast API to generate um, still beautiful documentation without repeating ourselves too much. I'm done. Thank you, Martin. Okay, here are the, here are the questions. Is it really that connection, uh, is the connection really going to be cached in dependency injection? Dependencies, uh, dependency caches live through that request or the whole app? Uh, you can define that, you can scope that. Um, by default, it's cached throughout the entire app, but when you invoke, when you define a dependency on a function, you can say not to use the cache. So by default, it's cached throughout the app. Do you think it makes sense to switch from Flask to Fast API for the sake of asynchronous quote unquote support? Um, if, I, if, if I have to write uh, an application that works on top of a lot of relational data and doesn't have to do anything with uh, machine learning or uh, data science, I would choose Django. Uh, in other cases, I would choose Fast API. And the last one. You mentioned you use Django before. Uh, when does it make sense, if ever, to rewrite a Django REST framework app to Fast API, and when does it not make sense? I would never rewrite an entire application because there's no, simply no time for it. <laughs> <laughs> and because yeah, it's yeah. There's a lot of hidden requirements in a in a code base that lives on for years. So a rewrite is, I think, definitely going to fail. <laughs> Thank you so much, Martin. Mikrobit je programovateľný milý počítač, ktorý ti dovolí prepojiť informatiku s kreativitou. Dá sa programovať veľmi jednoducho a ovládať tak, aby robil presne to, čo chceš. O pár minút sme zvládli rozsvietiť vlastný obrázok na displeji a o chvíľu sme už obrázky diálkovo prepínali druhým mikrobitom. Mikrobit má v sebe aj super vychytávky, ako sú tlačidlá, senzor pohybu, kompas a teplomé. K mikrobitu ale môžeš pripojiť množstvo ďalších vecí. Tu programujeme, aká animácia sa nám má ukázať na LED pásiku. Ja som na ňom naprogramovala dúhu. Teraz programujeme podľa nôd kohútika Jarabého. Najlepšie na mikrobite je, že si viem vytvoriť napríklad blikajúceho robota alebo gitaru, ktorú ovládam tak, že ňou zatraciem, 
alebo futbalovú bránku, kde mi mikrobit počíta, koľko gólov som dala, alebo kúlové svietiace topánky a tisíc ďalších vecí, ktoré ešte len vymyslím. Mikrobit je hračka, ktorú schováš do dlane a vytvoríš z nej čokoľvek. Tak čo s ňou spravíš ty? Každých 60 sekúnd si 28 tisíc ľudí predplatí službu Netflix. Odošle sa 197 miliónov e-mailov, stiahne sa 414 tisíc aplikácií a ukradne niekoľko tisíc hesiel. Na internete sa toho deje veľa. A všetko najdôležitejšie sa dozviete na Živé SK. Živé SK. Technológie ľudskou rečou.